Calgary Cannons were having a home game in 1997, and the ballpark sprinklers came on, and the grounds crew couldn't shut off the sprinklers. And a priest appeared from the stands with a bucket, placed it over one of the sprinklers, and sat on it to contain the water in that area of the field. <laughs> Welcome to episode 214 of Alberta Dugout Stories, the podcast. I'm Joe McFarland. One of the things we're hoping to do a little differently in 2023 is talk to more than just the players and coaches about the game here in Alberta. From volunteers and officials to announcers and authors, we hope to bring you some more variety as the year goes on. And this week's episode delves into that world as our guest actually takes up two of those titles. Tim Haggerty is a baseball broadcaster with the El Paso Chihuahuas, the AAA affiliate of the San Diego Padres, having called professional games since 2004. The Massachusetts native is also an author with freelance work featured in the Sporting News, the Hardball Times, and more. Haggerty has also written two baseball books, the first being Root for the Home Team, Minor League Baseball's most off-the-wall team names and the stories behind them. He's now out with a second book, Tales from the Dugout, 1001 Humorous, Inspirational, and Wild Anecdotes from minor league baseball and yes there are stories from here in alberta including calgary edmonton lethbridge medicine hat and interestingly enough bassano our ian wilson caught up with Haggerty recently to talk about his career the book and some of the connections to our province tim welcome to the podcast thank you ian thanks for the invite so i definitely do want to get to the book today before we get into that i'd like to get into your uh your, your broadcast career and your, your um, experience with baseball uh, prior to that. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Did broadcast uh, bring you to baseball or did baseball bring you into broadcasting? How did that come together for you? Um, they are both passions that kind of met later. Probably like a lot of people, I was captured by baseball at a very young age. Um, I can still remember walking into Fenway Park after the last day of school in first grade, I grew up in the Boston area and was just stunned by it, um, the grass, everything about it, and obsessively read the Boston Globe box scores. Probably a similar story you get from a lot of people you talk to. Um, but even as a kid, I was always 99% baseball. You know, as a family, we'd watch the Bruins, we'd watch the Patriots, the NFL team, but I was always just uh, immersed in, in baseball. And when I was in high school, the town's cable access TV station was there at the high school, and they had this program where students could host a show, could do play-by-play, and I really got infected with broadcasting then in high school. And yeah, now I'm 40 years old, and I've been announcing games more than half my life, I guess, because I started in high school. So yeah, from there I went to college in Vermont. I used to get media credentials to the Expos games. This was uh, in the Expos final few years, so I've spent a lot of time in Quebec. I've never been to Alberta, but but hope to someday. But I've been to Ontario and Quebec. And yeah, I think it was, it was a merging of just loving baseball and really being hooked on broadcasting that made me pursue this. And then your, your gig now, you're with the El Paso Chihuahuas, is it? Is that the name of the team? Yeah, that's the yeah. Padres AAA team. Beautiful stadium here. It's a great setup. Awesome. And tell me about just that experience, uh, just covering that team. And in Alberta here, we had the Edmonton Trappers and we had the Calgary Cannons. And baseball fans in this neck of the woods get very nostalgic about the times that uh, the Cannons and Trappers played here. Of course, we had tons of major leaguers come through here, both on the way up to the majors, on the way down, here for rehab stints. It was just a, a great level of baseball. But So, like I said, people get... Uh, <laughs> pretty sad about it not being here anymore but but we can uh, account to, to how good of caliber of baseball it is yeah regrettably i was not in the pacific coast league when either or really any of the three canadian teams were still in it with vancouver being the other um but yeah the calgary club as you know became albuquerque in 2003 and then the edmonton franchise moved to round rock the following year 2004 at that time i was still in the lower levels of the minor leagues was not yet in the pcl but there are veteran announcers I talked to who are friends who loved both, talked about the atmosphere of both, just loved it. You know, and I know there's the West Coast League team in Edmonton. Rob Nyer is a friend of mine, the commissioner of that league, and he said they had a great season and had great attendance there, so I was happy to see that thriving. And um, Yeah, I, I can definitely understand that nostalgia. I always thought it was funny when Calgary was a Marlins affiliate. You know, your, your mm-hmm. major league club was 
thousand miles away from your AAA <laughs> team. Yeah, it's uh, some of the affiliations were interesting over the years, to say the least. So, uh, of course, the Mariners was was a longer standing uh, uh, affiliate for for Calgary, and and geographically that made a little bit more sense. But yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, l- let's move on to the book. Uh, tell me about the origins of of this project. How did how did this come about for you, and uh, how long it, you know in in Talking to you earlier, it seems like this was definitely some years in the in the making and bringing it uh, to fruition. It was more than a decade. I've always loved baseball history and research, and when researching something else back in 2012, I came across this newspaper archive story about a Texas League game in Austin being delayed when a wild bull ran on the field, <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, if I've never heard this story, the odds are most fans haven't either. So that's what really sparked it. And the longer I went, the more I found there were just crazy stories from the early days of minor league baseball and also to the current day. So I developed this document and compiled about 1,100 short, quick, crazy stories from minor league history of the past and the present. And from there, I reached a point where I knew this was now book length. Uh, Each one has a catchy headline at the beginning. I wanted a publisher that could develop some cartoonish illustrations for them as well. So the book has that. Um, So then it was just a matter of how do I sort these 1,100 stories? And one day I was walking past my wife's cookbook and on the spine of the book it said 1,001 recipes. And I thought that's a good number, 1,001. (laughs) So I then actually had to trim down stories. For example, in 1907 there was an umpire who was arrested for using profane language during a game. (laughs) <laughs> and then in the 1930s, there was a player who was arrested. Keep in mind, I'm saying not just thrown out, but arrested for using <laughs> profane language. So when trimming down stories, that's what I did, is I would take two similar stories like that and merge them. Right. Uh, make that one entry instead of two. And, yeah, then it became a, a book from Cider Mill Press. They're a company that's really into visual books. So as you flip through it, you see some great illustrations and a lot of cool design work. There's a number of things I, I really enjoy about the book. Um, one is that it is, you've got these bite-sized bits of information, trivia, anecdotes, however you want to dub them. So you can you can pick it up, put it down, like you don't have to get into it and commit to it, you know, for several hours. You can just kind of glean through it uh, here and there. And, and I think that's a, that's a really good aspect to it. And also just that it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, right? <laughs> Um, maybe tell me about some of that, uh, the enjoyment you got in just uh, putting all this together. Thank you. That was my goal is that it was fun and that you can pick it up and, and find some new things in it every time you do pick it up. I tried to gauge it as would a casual fan find this interesting? Would a casual fan have a reaction to this, whether it was laughing or whether it was being amazed by something? My wife is not a huge sports fan. She's very casually a sports fan. So sometimes... I might just tell her a story, and if she reacted, I thought, okay, that's good. That, that's my <laughs> test. Um, the, the, to me, the target audience was not somebody who watches 150 baseball games a year. It's somebody who couldn't believe it. You know, as I, I made some notes here uh, for our conversation. For example, the Calgary Cannons were having a home game in 1997, and the ballpark sprinklers came on, and the grounds crew couldn't shut off the sprinklers and a priest appeared from the stands with a bucket, placed it over one of the sprinklers, and sat on it to contain the water in that area of the field. <laughs> like that's the type of thing. When I heard that story, like tell me more. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I first when I first heard about that, I need to know where did this game happen? Um, what year was it? So that was my goal: was finding unique stories that do not happen in your typical ball game, and. To me, that's always been my favorite part about baseball is the stories. I don't think I could have completed this book because I think just based on, and and again, we we spoke a little bit about this uh, via email, I I would have gone off on so many tangents and down so many rabbit holes. (laughs) And I just, I, you know, it's one of those things where you you pull on one thread and, and, you know, 20 more emerge. Did you... Was that a challenge, like maintaining some discipline of like, okay, I've got the nuts and bolts of this, or did you, did you know, how far did you have to go down some of these, uh, uh, pull, on, pull on these different threads? For sure. There was one story in particular that I worked on as a hobby 
for about a year, off and on, one story. And that was, there was a former player who told me about a fly ball that disappeared. And it was in a double-A game, Jersey City, New Jersey, in 1978. And there were some big names in this game. Wade Boggs was playing for visiting Bristol. Ricky Henderson's playing for Jersey City. And apparently, on a clear night, it was not a foggy situation, a right-handed batter hit a fly ball to right field very high, and the ball vanished. <laughs> the ball did not go over the fence. It did not go on the stands. It did not land on the field. And it sounds crazy, but um, players who were on the field all told me the same story. I even talked to a fan who was at this game, and they all said everyone just kind of froze, and they were in disbelief. <laughs> what happened to the ball? Um so the umpires got together and gave the batter a double. So that's the precedence. <laughs> when when the ball disappears, the batter gets a double. But that was the one especially that did become a rabbit hole. Uh, to make sure I, I got the details right on this story, but also just because it was so fascinating, like, yeah. you know, ball goes up and doesn't come down. What happens? Um, so that was one that was a definite rabbit hole, to borrow your phrase, but to me, that was the fun of it. Yeah. I, uh, you know, because I have a job and, and a family, it, it wasn't my style to put together a book proposal, get a book deal, and then work on it for a year like so many writers do. This was, I was working on this over the course of a decade as a hobby slash passion, and then got the book deal later. I think that's when it would become really stressful and having to discipline yourself is if, there was a ticking clock. You had to have it done by a certain date. But luckily, I didn't. Did you ever solve the mystery of the missing ball, or is it forever lost to the ether? Or, or like, is there a future <laughs> Halloween mystery book uh, just on that story? So the, the people, the participants in the game do still consider this a mystery. There was a kid behind the outfield defense who was holding a ball, but other people said it was not the game ball. That was one theory. Did a bird swoop by and somehow <laughs> catch it on its way? Did it vanish? Uh, one person noted that the magician, the illusionist, David Copperfield, is from New Jersey, not far from there. <laughs> Maybe he made something happen as a kid. But to me, that's what makes the story even so much interesting, is that people who are on the field still don't know the answer. And obviously in your time as a broadcaster uh, with El Paso, you would have seen some things, I assume. Uh, maybe some things you, you can't share. <laughs> maybe some things that you can. And I know uh, a number of those uh, anecdotes and, and incidents uh, are, are mentioned in the book as well. Yeah, this will be my 19th season broadcasting minor league games. And I'd say out of the 1,001, there's about 20 stories that came from games that I witnessed in person. One here in El Paso was in 2015. There was a wiener dog race on the field between innings, and four out of the five dogs ran from the start line to the finish line. Well, one of them made a turn and ran all around the infield, and they delayed the game as fielders were running around trying to pick up this dog. <laughs> and it was funny. Uh, I had a chance to go on MLB Network in January to talk about my book, and that was one of the stories that uh, they were looking for video for. And... It wasn't until now, um, you know, eight years later, that I noticed that one of the infielders looking at this wiener dog running around is Corey <laughs> Seager, who's become a, a major league star. Oh, yeah. He was on the infield for Oklahoma City that night. So, um, <laughs> made me think of that. You know, I think he, he was a World Series MVP in 20. To think five years ago, this guy was watching a wiener dog <laughs> run around on the field. Is it just me, or does baseball, and in particular minor league baseball, just lend itself to these kind of stories like it just feels like it's such a match it's not to say that bizarre things don't happen in football or basketball or hockey but it just seems i don't know there's some there's a fit there that uh, that seems perfect i agree with you and i think part of that is just the volume of games i mean cities big and small across the united states across canada pretty much all of them have had professional baseball at some time at some level and then when you talk about within a season how many games there are, AAA season these days is 150 games. There was a time that the Pacific Coast League was more than 200 games a season. So I think when you just think about how many games there have been across the minor leagues, there have been many more minor league games than there have been major league games. 
So I think when you think about that, there's just more possibilities for crazy things to happen. And especially back in the day when the budgets weren't as they are now and there was different standards, um, a lot of chaos happened then. <laughs> and also in the modern era, there's been some pretty wild things as teams really try to make headlines with bizarre promotions um, and that sort of thing. You mentioned a, a good Alberta story. Were there other Alberta stories that kind of caught your eyes? Uh, anything from either the Pioneer League days of Alberta or, or PCL or otherwise? I loved finding that in 1907 in the Western Canada League, they would start their games at 6 p.m. or later. Um, you and your audience probably knows why, because of the late sunsets <laughs> there. But to think of night games in 1907, I thought that was really cool, so I put that in the book. Um we talked about the, the sprinkler delay. Let me see. Oh, I like this one. In 1988, Colorado Springs and Calgary had to finish a suspended game, make up a postponed game, and then play their regularly scheduled game. They played a triple header on August 2nd, 1988. And I love that. Let's play three is the headline I put above <laughs> it. 2016, um, there was two Appalachian League teams in rookie ball, Pirates and Cardinals affiliates there, and they had to make up a bunch of games as well. So they decided to do the same thing. But the farm directors for the teams said no. They said, no, we're not playing more than two games in one day. And I, it was so deflating to me. I understand why they said that. They're looking to protect their pitcher's arms. But I thought, what a cool story. In 2016, there would be a triple header. We almost had it. But uh, we did have it in Colorado Springs and Calgary in 88. Yeah, and that was one of the, sorry to cut you off there earlier, but that was one of the tidbits that did send me down uh uh, looking for more was that uh, Cannon's triple header in in '88, and because uh, I was just like I had to know who who played in this game, and uh, some of the bigger names, uh, Omar Vizquel and uh, Edgar Martinez were two guys that, that they played all three games. So it's that's not something you see every wow. day, and and a testament to you know to the to the players just like yeah, let's let's get back at her. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and earlier we were talking about more modern stories and how teams will develop some unique promotions to try and not only bring fans to the park, but get their name in the headlines. I know it's not there with you in Alberta, but Winnipeg had a cool one in 2005. They set the world record for most people simultaneously brushing their teeth. <laughs> 6,234 fans um, received a complimentary toothbrush and toothpaste as part of the Manitoba Dental Association promotion. <laughs> the Tooth Fairy was there, and all the fans brushed their teeth at the same time to set a record. I don't know what the water situation was, what we're doing with uh, having to spit out the toothpaste. That probably got messy, but uh, I put that in the book as well. Well, anything for better health care, hey? I guess uh, <laughs> that's that's a yeah. more, more novel one and a, di a different twist on uh, all the spitting that can take place at a, at a, at a ball game. Um, one of the other things I, I really enjoyed with, with the book and with the, the nuggets uh, found within was that it really does cover a lengthy time span. And by that, I don't just mean like, you, you know, you did rem reference uh, incidents from 1907 and some of the things that happened in, in decades gone by as, as far as like more than a century ago, but also as current as uh, I think... Uh, uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, or 2021, uh, definitely there were some more current uh, events as well. So you definitely kept your your spreadsheet going uh, <laughs> right till the better, bitter end before the, the, the deadline, I see. Thank you. That's what the publisher um, really wanted to make sure. In fact, they put that in the agreement that at least 200 stories have happened since 2016. Uh, people like you and I love the chaos of early baseball, but that's okay if somebody doesn't. I think they'll still enjoy the book if they're more into the current game and some crazy things that have happened within the last decade. So, um, yeah, thanks for noticing that. We definitely strive for that to really balance it out with the past and the present. And we do have some 2022 stories. For example, the Blue Jays A team in Manchester, New Hampshire, they played a game as the Manchester Chicken Tenders. <laughs> uh, chicken tenders were apparently first cooked at a diner in Manchester, New Hampshire in 1974. <laughs> I remember researching that one and being a little bit surprised that chicken tenders weren't older than that, 1974. Yeah, that seems pretty new. Exactly. Oh, here's a good one involving a Blue Jays of 
affiliate. It was briefly delayed, AAA Buffalo's home game on August 6, 2022, briefly delayed because there was a turkey walking around on the warning track <laughs> right there on the field in Buffalo. <laughs> Do do you have to worry now that uh, you're going to get bombarded with these odd stories? Like, are you are you going to be the uh, lightning rod for every uh, weird thing that happens? And if so, is that something that you'll welcome coming into your your inbox and being hit up on for social media? Or are you like, oh no, I'm just going to get flooded with this stuff? <laughs> I hope so. I, I love hearing about crazy stories that happen. I don't think there will ever be a sequel to the book. I, I tried to really compile the most wild stories and have a very high bar for what got into the book. So I think this really summarizes the um, craziest stories that are the most known. But inevitably, yeah, something will happen in 2023 and somebody will let me know about it. I'd love that. Um, it's good to be known for something. If, I, if I'm the you know prince of minor league <laughs> wackiness, I'll take that. <laughs> What's next for you, Tim? What uh, you've got? Obviously, a season ahead uh, with El Paso. Uh, anything else, literary wise, or or just looking forward to getting the season going? I, I can tell you really quickly with all the snow we've had today <laughs> in Alberta, the the signs of spring training emerging from from south of the border are a welcome sight. <laughs> well, we're lucky here in El Paso. They call it Sun City. We apparently have the most sunny days per year in the United States. So um, our snow is infrequent but there are times i i do miss what you're saying with what what you uh experienced today as crazy as that sounds with the snow but as far as what's next yeah we're getting ready for the el paso chihuahua season i'll be broadcasting 150 games you can find those broadcasts on the chihuahua's website um and other than that looking to let people know about this book uh don't have any current plans for another one i'm just looking to do what i did here uh on your show tell some stories and let people know about this book and how good it looks. It, it was very well designed. That part had nothing to do with me, but the illustrations are really fun and people can order it anywhere books are sold, whether that's on Amazon, Amazon Canada and bookstores. Uh, yeah, every copy would be, would be very appreciated. So that's great. That's what we have coming up next. Tell me a little bit, uh, before I let you go, and I'll just keep you for a couple more questions here, but, uh, the promotion side of it, uh, I'm curious about that. I, I know the, the labor that goes into, writing and publishing the book is one thing but uh now that you're other on the other side of it to, to the promotional end and going on mlb network and things like that does that become more of a fun uh aspect of it for you or is it uh you know is it like is it more work <laughs> no for sure i enjoy it um and i think that this book lends itself well to promotion because especially in the summertime when there aren't as many sporting events going on you know let's say uh, a radio station in Minnesota, hey, let's have this guy on. He'll tell five crazy baseball stories from Minnesota, and we'll let people know about his book. And it takes 15 minutes, and it was fun, and maybe that sells a few copies. Um, I really enjoy telling stories, so I think this is an avenue to do that. And in the process, it creates more awareness for the book. So that's what I like about it on the promotion side. It really has a local angle, I think, to pretty much every city and state across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, province in your case, of course, but you know, just the way we talked about a couple of Alberta stories, that really can be done to all regions. That's great. Uh, we, well, you definitely have done a good job of telling some stories, uh, both on the podcast today and uh, and in the book as well. Uh, we do have one last question for you. We ask this of every uh, guest who comes on our podcast, or we try to, and that is, what does the game of baseball mean to you? Um. It has meant a lot of different things over the years, but it has given me so much professionally. I've been to 49 states and Canada, and the biggest reason is baseball, the travels, whether that be starting a new job and relocating or the travels to cover road games. Um, it's given me so many gifts. Uh, I met my wife as a result of a baseball job in Portland, Oregon. So I think to me it's become really personal. I think I, think I learned that the last few years when – I was troubled by some of the patterns that were happening on field with there being more time between balls and play. I know it's been such a big discussion point, and I'm really excited that pitch timers are coming to Major League Baseball because after seeing it last year work so well in AAA, I think it's going to bring the game back to normal with uh, the pace and the rhythm. But what I found was it was more of a concern than it was just not liking it. I, I really felt 
invested, that maybe fans were going down a path of not getting as much as I did when I was a fan as a kid, and that really worried me. So I think that as an example showed uh, how much it meant to me. It is very personal. I want baseball to thrive, and I'm really optimistic about it now. So uh, I think today's athletes with those new rules, it's going to make baseball blossom even more than it does. So, um, yeah, to me, it's more than, than fandom. I think really my whole life, obsession is kind of a negative word, so we'll call it a passion. But the <laughs> truth is, there probably was times that it was an obsession. And, you know, even professionally, I think I've, I've worked hard to make that more healthy. But there were times when I was younger that how I did on the air that night, that is well, how I felt uh, after the game. If it was good, I felt great. If it wasn't, I did not. I, I was totally attached to that. So, hmm. um, yeah, it's definitely much more than a game to me. Well, Tim, thank you so much for making uh, time for us today and, and for just uh, providing us with uh, some great uh, stories to chat about. Uh, and, of course, we are we're stoked for that uh, MLB baseball season. Uh, we've got baseball in our community in the WCL, which you referenced in the Western Canadian Baseball League. Uh, and, uh, you know, we always keep an eye on the college baseball and uh, some of the minor league happenings as well. So uh, just excited to see that, and especially when it happens locally here. So take care and all the best in 2023. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Ian. Thanks again to Tim Haggerty for joining us this week, and thanks to Ian Wilson for the great interview. Thanks to all of you as well for downloading and listening, and a tip of the cap to our Platinum supporters for all they do for us and for baseball in Alberta. The Okotoks Dogs are reloading for the 2023 season in hopes of repeating as WCBL champions. Take a look at some of their recruits and schedule information at dogsbaseball.ca. And AHP Academy has had a busy offseason with a major facility change and two new Academy team names, the Renegades and the Rustlers. You can learn more about their offerings at ahpbaseball.com. And if you or your organization would like to join us as a sponsor, we'd love to have you. Email us at albertadugoutstories at gmail.com and we'll fill you in on our supporter program. Until next time, thank you for all your support online, on social, and on air of Alberta Dugout Stories.